think we're ready. As ready as I can be anyway. Our text to remember is from Revelation 7, those important verses 2 through 4. Let me just read them. I know it's going to come up later in our lesson. And I saw another angel ascending from the east having the seal of the living god and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea saying hurt not the earth neither the sea nor the trees till we have sealed the servants of our god in their foreheads and I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Again, Revelation 2, excuse me, 7, verses 2 through 4. Those are so um, po uh, words to ponder here uh, for us living at the end of time. Now I'm going to now open up our lesson. Now we're talking about the seal. Oops, got way back here in just a minute. This is our the last slide, but let's go to the first slide. Now, we're all familiar with seals. Here's the seal of the President of the United States. And everything that's in that seal is significant, whether it's the arrows or the stars that go around or the stars above it and the eagle, it's all chosen to give a message. Now this next one is the seal of the government of the United States. And it's similar, arrows and eagle stars, but it also is telling a story of importance to anyone who understands what that um, leafy branch is in one claw or foot of the eagle and what the arrows mean in the other foot. It's there. Now, every state also has a seal. And this happens to be the seal for the state of Florida. And everything in that seal, the steamboat, the lady, the flowers, the Palm trees are, are all significant to the state of Florida. And you might look up the seal of your state. Um, I can't list them all. I just happened to find one that seemed to work for Florida. But And, and this is um, what they wrote about the seal in Florida. But it's true for your state and for my state. And so just put your state in here as I read. The great seal of the state of Florida is used to represent the government of the state of Florida and for various official purposes, such as to seal official documents and legislation. It is commonly, commonly used on state government buildings, vehicles, and other effects of the state government, and it also appears on the state flag. And, and so it represents whatever um, is producing that seal, whether it's the state or the U.S. government, other governments, nations have their seals, and God has a seal. We're going to get to that. But also, do you know, or you probably know, about the mature um, that the papacy puts on its documents or its published material and it's an official approval now we're talking about seal God seal the these other secular seals but the papacy has sort of you might call a seal that it puts on its published works and this is what it means taken from a Catholic website, imprimatur is a, an official approval from the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church stating that a literary or similar work is totally free of error in all matters of faith and doctrine and hence is acceptable reading for faithful Catholics. Approval is also sometimes indicated by the words nihil obstat, which means nothing hinders. There is no obstacle, in other words, to publication. An imprimatur is not given lightly. It follows a thorough review process. It is usually printed on a page at 
or near the beginning of the work, the name and title of the official censor or, or other ecclesiastical authority, and the date that permission was given is always accompanies either of these two types of declarations. So here's a page from a particular book. It has nin I'm probably saying it wrong. Nihil Obstat, given by a censor librarian, John Ferns, so to speak. Then the Imprimaturs by Francis Cardinal Spellman, Archbishop of New York. That's one example. Now, you may know, and I'm sure some of you know, that this Imprimatur was given to only one book um, written by a Seventh-day Adventist, only one that I know of. And I did a little research and couldn't find any more, but nobody probably thinks it's very important. But it is to me, and it might be to you. This particular book is Samuel Bakioki's book, From Sabbath to Sunday. It was printed by the Pontifical Gregorian University Press in Rome in 1977, but it has this imprimatur on it, which officially states everything in this book is um, true and faithful Catholic doctrine, that the Catholics can recommend it to all of their membership to read. Now, I haven't read the book. Perhaps you have. Maybe you have thoughts about it. But I'm just putting that out there, that the papacy has their seal also. This is their seal on publications, on written materials. Now, okay, Stumps, yes, please go right ahead. I did just mention that I asked a Catholic priest about that specific book and about the imprimatur upon it. And he said that this is the imprimatur from the Gregorian uh, school. Yes. And says this is a Jesuit school. And it, this is a place where only our best people can go to. Not anyone can get into this school. Interesting, isn't it? Yes, it is. And and that point is true. I should have brought that up, that it's from the press, imprimatur from the press. But nevertheless, it is still stating everything in this book is up to snuff with Catholic doctrine, if I understand it correctly. Okay, now, our lesson this week in the quarterly, and thank you for sharing, Pastor. Our lesson this week in the quarterly is about the seal of God and the mark of the beast. Two heavy, heavy, almost ponderous subjects, doctrines that impact upon us like no other doctrine does. The Sabbath and the counterfeit Sabbath. Now, up to this point, we have studied these things. We've talked about the counterfeit Sabbath. Uh, we've talked about the Sabbath. We've put it all together in a nice little package. And, uh, and it should be clear and distinct in your minds. We're going to do some review. But before the lesson is over, uh, we're going to go into uh, a manuscript by Ellen White. And then the last part, I, I would like to pull in the Protestant Reformation, and how they approached the Sabbath. Now, we know um, Luther, Martin Luther, didn't have all the truth from scriptures, but he was used of God for his um, uh, a clarion call about the papacy and, um, the, the, and the Antichrist, but not about the Sabbath, not even about the Trinity. There were things he didn't. I understand, but God did use him. But here we are at the end of time. All of this truth has been showered on us. There, there It's showers of blessing, but it's also showers of responsibility and showers of calling for a response from God's people. And we'll get, get into all that, but I would like for us to read, and I know... Um, Last time, was it last week, 
we read these, and then I couldn't get through the lesson because we read all the references, and I'm hoping you have studied the quarterly, you have read the references, so I don't have to spend a lot of time on them. I'll spend some time, but we need these scriptures in our minds as we go through our lesson. So let's start with Second Corinthians 1. 21 to 22, and then chapter 5 and verse 5. And we'll talk a little bit about this, about what some of these terms mean. Here we go. 1, 21, and 22. Now he which establisheth us with you in Christ, and hath anointed us, is God who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. I'll talk about sealing in a little bit, but I first want to talk about earnest. What does this mean, this word earnest? It has given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. What you know, Maybe you know, maybe you haven't thought about it, or maybe it hasn't been clear to you. But this word, Greek word earnest is Arabon, English word, way of saying it. In the New Testament, it is used only of that which, and the, these are from some commentators' thoughts uh, in Lagos that I pulled together, but I think this is Vine speaking. Um, it is used only of that which is assured by God to believers. In the New Testament, this Arabon, it it means something assured by God, translated earnest into English, but it's something assured by God to believers related to the Hebrew Old Testament Urban, which is translated or means means pledge, as in Genesis thirty eight, seventeen to twenty, and we'll look at that in a minute, but let me go on. This word was in common use during the Canaanitish times among traders, meaning earnest money that was paid for a cow or for land or for something else. It constituted a down payment, a pledge that the full sum would be paid as promised. That's how it was used in the secular world at that time. But now we're in the Greek New Testament world, and um, Paul is saying that the Spirit is given to us as an earnest, or it's like assured by God. Now, just to get the context of what uh, this, these thoughts, I'm paraphrasing them, are come from the SDA Bible Commentary, but going back to Genesis 28, we read about this Hebrew word, Erebon, which is means a pledge. Genesis 38. Let's look at that. And you remember this. This is Tamar. Judas is um, deceived by her. In 17 we read, well, let's back up. Um, 15. When Judas saw her, he thought her to be a harlot because she had covered her face. And he turned unto her by the way, and said, Go to, I pray thee, let me come in unto thee, for he knew not that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, What wilt thou give me that thou mayest come in unto me? And he said, I will send thee a kid from the flock. And she said, Wilt thou give me a pledge, Erebon, um, till thou sendest it? Thou send it, and he said, What pledge shall I give thee? And she said, Thy signet, thy bracelet, thy staff, etc. Or And it goes on. And so she's asking for a pledge. He's giving her a pledge, which means I pledge to send you the kid from the flock. And so that's how one way it was used in the Old Testament going on. But let's back up. We have to go now to did we read 2 Corinthians 5.5? 5, 5? It's a reiteration, but let's read it. Now he that hath wrought us for the self same thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit, this pledge, this assurance 
of the Spirit. Now we know he, um, to those who uh, open their hearts to him, he knocks on their heart's doors in Laodicea, and he opens their hearts unto them. He, we open our hearts unto him, and he comes in. He brings his spirit with him, his converting spirit, so we, be, we are changed from that selfful, selfful uh, sinful person into uh, a selfless, giving, um, benevolent person and, and um, sin-free through justification and sanctification. That's part of the deal, too. So this earnest of the Spirit, this assurance is given, and um, it's reiterated here, 2 Corinthians 5.5. 5. Let's move on to uh, Ephesians 4.30 which states and grieve not the holy spirit of god whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption now this word grieve it's pretty much the same meaning we have today as it was used uh, back in the king james version but um grieving it means to make sad or distressed. It can also mean to vex or irritate or offend or insult. Um, however, we want to understand that we're not to do that to the Holy Spirit because we are sealed. Um, Paul is saying here in verse 30, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. And this word, now we're going to get into sealed, but grieve not. Don't, don't irritate, insult, or make sad God's spirit. That spirit is pneuma. In Greek, it's pneuma. And then it's uh, hagios, a form of hagios, holy spirit. Now the word sealed in the New Testament. Now the G is silent. Chavezo, Chavezo, um, I forget how it's pronounced, but I know it's a silent G. But that Greek word means to attest, to certify, to acknowledge. It's an emblem, this seal, this uh, noun ver form of this verb is an emblem of ownership. God owns us, but not only ownership, but built into it is a security. God makes us secure. We, we have so much to be thankful for. If we surrender our lives to him, how great he is, we sang. How great he's, uh, the work is that he's done in our lives. And he continues through his long suffering. I, I'm sure when he looks at this evil world and the wickedness in it and the suffering and the pain and death, yes, death is there all around us. People get ill. People suffer. They're in pain. Uh, and not only that, they abuse other people's people voluntarily sub cause others to experience. It's all through our world. I don't have to tell you this. And so his wrath, God is holding back his wrath for you and me. And we're going to read more why later on. But for you and me. And, and also he's long-suffering and willing that none perish beyond his little flock, beyond his remnant, which might extend to our families. We've prayed about our families, our children, our siblings, our contacts in the neighborhood, in the families, in the church family, brothers and sisters. We're we're here as a united body to worship God and hopefully to learn about him this morning. And then we'll have this church service later where we will be more instructed in God's ways. Um, so we're here to worship God and to learn of him. And, um, and he wants to reign on the throne of our hearts. He wants to be king of Annika, king of every one of you. And, and he, 
doesn't have anything ill in mind for you. Only your best. He, And if we surrender, he will take charge. He will own us and make us secure. That's um, that security is involved in this word that we translate, this Greek word we translate as seal, or to put a seal upon. There's a verb um, version of this Greek word, noun seal, put a seal upon. And we read about putting a seal upon in Revelation 20, verse 3. So let's just look there for, for a minute. Oh. It's not on you or me. 20 verse 3, and cast him, i.e. verse 2 tells us Satan, that old serpent, the dragon, the devil, cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up. That means lock him up. Shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. So this seal, this seal can be a literal seal, like we opened up with the seal of our nation, the seal of the president, etc. It's a literal thing that's done in artwork and replicated on vehicles, etc. It's literal, but it can have, and for us, it has a metaphorical uh, meaning that it's abstract in the sense that God, if we are right with God, he accepts us, he denotes us as his, he certifies and acknowledges by this concept of seal that we are his. And it's more than that, brothers and sisters. And it's coming up, and it's 10.08. We should get to it. But uh, I'll just tell you briefly that it's his pledge. He seals us. It's his. And th those aren't my words. These are Ellen White's way of describing it. A pledge from God. He pledges. He seals us. Um, I know pledge was part of the earnest part, but this seal is also a pledge that we are his and that he will take care of us and he will see to our needs whether we're in the time of trouble or we have silent requests now of needs that are personal that we don't want to share and that's fine um, but he knows and he if you're walking arm in arm with him through this day as Enoch walked as Elijah walked John the Baptist walked all the prophets walked, although I know um, all of them were hu human and have um, exhibited maybe unworthy traits of character. I I'm not saying anything about anyone, but I just know, like Elijah was despondent and depressed, but he was used of God. He walked with God. The chariot came and took. Elijah is in heaven now. We're here, and still struggling and still facing the evil all about us and the temptations. But Elijah was taken to heaven by the God. And so even though he had his moments, and you have yours and I have mine, hopefully they're behind us, but we don't know what today holds. We don't know what tomorrow holds. But we do know, it's like the song is, I know who holds my hand, and we, that's all we need to know. And so this, um, this sealing, yes, it, um, it's an acknowledgement, it's an emblem, a, a metaphorical emblem that we belong to God. And I, I don't know, if we have time, we'll come back to the rest of these verses, but I've put them in there. You can read how um, this Greek word that's translated sealed is used in these other references. It can be literal, it can be metaphorical, and I have 2 Timothy closed there. Let's see what 2 Timothy says. Chapter 2, verse 19. And I'll say, is that right? So, chapter 2, it must, oh, I'm in Titus, sorry. 2 Timothy 2, 19.
nevertheless. The foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. <laughs> the foundation of God has this seal, that the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. God knows everyone that are everyone that is his. Now let's look up. Let's back up to where does it talk about binding? It's Isaiah eight verse sixteen. Let's look at these are references your quarterly has used for this as a foundation for this lesson. So uh, we're scanning through them. 8 verse 16, yes, says, Bind up the testimony. Seal the law among my disciples. Now, you should know that he's talking about, well, let's back up for 11. For the Lord spake thus to me with a strong hand and instructed me, that I should not walk in the way of this people, saying, Say ye not a confederacy to all them to whom this people shall say a confederacy. Neither fear their fear, nor be afraid. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself, and let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. And he shall be for a sanctuary. But for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. Bind up the testimony. In other words, in the context, it's the testimony given to Isaiah. Bind it up and seal the law among my disciples. Those that handful of people um, uh, with Isaiah who are not like the others who will fall and stumble and who have um, don't fear the Lord. So, but let me tell you a little bit about this binding up. It's Sarah, and it means to bind up or to tie. It's to bind it up tightly. It's used for binding a stone in a sling. It's in that stone held um, well. And, and that's Proverbs 26, 8. Or for mending an old, torn wine skin. God, and so these are literal things that this uh, verb, Hebrew verb, is used for like a, sling, a stone in a sling, or like fixing a rent in a wineskin. You bind it up, you make it tight and secure. But God is also said to bind up the water in the thick clouds. Think about that. How he binds that water in the clouds before it pours down on us. Hosea describes the sin of Ephraim as bound up, i.e., the understanding, and this is from Theological Word Book of, of, um, of oh, Theological Word Book Old Testament. These are thoughts that I've condensed from that particular book. That Hosea describes the sin of Ephraim as bound up, bound up tightly like that, i.e., kept in store for the time of judgment. And there's the text for it. And uh, then um, Isaiah exhorts his disciples to bind this up to uh, the message, the testimony. Bind up the testimony. Keep it close to you. Tie it up. Don't let it, don't let it um, slowly seep away from you. Um, that's the word to bind up. Now, but we read also in the Old Testament here in verse 16, seal the law. The basic meaning of this word is to seal or secure. I've mentioned that before in the Greek. But here in the Old Testament, to seal or secure, such as documents. This would be in a literal sense. They were affixed with a seal, like letters, decrees of kings, even covenants, purchases, books, we've talked about books already, but like in the um, book of Daniel, seal up 
um, the words for it's, you know, it's not for this time, seal it up. That means um, to hold it secure <laughs> and it will be revealed later. But that we read about that in Daniel 12, 9. Um, even the stars in Job 9, 7. This, you know, this is so nice to read. Let's just look at Job right there before Psalms. Job 9, 7 states in this poetic way about the stars. And, and this is Job speaking about God. How sh Verse 1 says, How should a man be just with God? And then he goes on to talk about God. He's wise in heart and mighty. He commanded the sun in verse 7. And it riseth not, and sealeth up the stars. The concept is they're secure up there in the universe. Now we know we have passing comments and comets, and um, things happen in the universe. Um, dark. I don't know how to explain it all, but whatever it is happening there, they're sealed up. These stars, they're secure. Uh, verse 7 says, You command the sun, and it riseth not, and sealeth up the stars, which alone spreadeth out the heavens, and treadeth upon the ways of the sea. Um, Job's pretty poetic in some ways, and gives us an understanding of God even rules the universe. We know that. Job knew that, too. Going on. Now, oh, part of the reference Part of the references that Quarterly gives us for our lesson today is Ezekiel 9. Now, Ezekiel 9 doesn't use the word English word seal. It uses, um, in verse 4, the word translated mark. So let's just read Ezekiel 9, 4. And it states, to this person referred to in verse 3, uh, the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's inkhorn by his side. To this man, the Lord said, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And if we back up to verse chapter 8 near the end, um, like I think verse 16 might say it, and he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men, with their backs toward the temple of God, and their faces toward the east, and they worshipped the sun toward the east. <clears throat> this is in um, the conclusion of other problems, uh, issues that God had with his people. They're worshiping the sun. And so um, God is telling this man, clothed with linen, with the writer's inkhorn, go, set a mark. Now, that word mark, that Hebrew word mark, it, it's ta, T-A-W. And that is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. This is from Thoughts from SDA Bible Commentary. In the time of Ezekiel, this Hebrew character was written in the form of an X. The marking was done in vision. And in the vision, the mark was doubtless literal. But in significance, it had reference wholly to the character or to character. The messenger was to pay no regard to birth or position, I should say wealth or education, no regard, um, but to mark only those who mourned for the prevailing sinfulness and kept themselves aloof from it. So this ta. Now, let's see if I have something else about this. No, but... Remember, it was the last letter of the alphabet. The last. And here we are at the last of time. 
and uh, we are to be sealed. We are to have this, it's called the mark of the beast and the seal of God, but this quote-unquote mark, it's not something that you see in the forehead. It's not literal. It, uh, the commentary brings out probably in vision. It was literal, but it stands for, it's representative of the character. And those who have developed the character of God, the character, not that we've always been perfect, but somehow God, just as uh, seamlessly as he brought us to this truth, he will bring us to this uh, condition in our character, not without struggles and temptations and um, um trials because this our hold on this world doesn't relinquish itself easily our hold on sin is our hold and if you remember that eagle grasping the arrows that's our hold on some parts not everything in this sinful world we don't it just takes one thing that we cling to brothers and sisters that will decide for us whether we're part of the eternal kingdom of God or that if we are destroyed with Satan and his evil angels at the end of time. It just takes one cherished sin. <clears throat> so, but God will do this if we just trust him. And every time we're tempted, look heavenward and even stop what you're doing if you have to and pray like Brother Brandon asked for prayer about his struggle with appetite and hopefully and prayer and fasting and hopefully you've been supporting him in that struggle because we all have struggles and some not necessarily because we are terrible people and, and we are without God. We are, no doubt about it. But we also struggle with genetics that have been passed down to us. For example, my mother died an alcoholic. She lived for alcohol. Everything was didn't matter. The house would be falling down upon her, and it did. And it didn't matter as long as she had her alcohol. And I know if I delved into that, I would have a uh, strong proclivity to that or to any other addictive substances. And so God has kept me from it, although Satan has tempted me with alcohol. But, you know, the thought that God, through his spirit and through the angel, said, why do I need alcohol to enjoy life? I can enjoy life just now the way I am. Don't need it. And so I didn't. But he tempted, and he may be tempting you with his anything, something way far away from that, you know, out of, out of the ballpark on addictive substances, but it might be something else. And so what I'm saying is that um, we, at the end of time, we know all this power that's available, that has been available, written in Scripture about God's people. And I'm going to share, we're getting, I should go there. I want to share about the Protestant Reformation also and how God saw those people through those perilous times. And we, our lesson I think next week is about Sabbath Reformation. It uses the word Reformation. It's not going back to what we know as the Protestant Reformation, but it's involving a Reformation. But but we are here at the end of time, and I, I don't have to say all this. You know it. We have all this knowledge, all this beautiful words of Scripture, Jesus' beautiful words on the Mount of Blessing, and all the words that he gave us, so important. And I know he spoke the woes to the Pharisees, woe unto you, but those are also teaching words to us. But let's, we need to go on. Let's see how this connects. In the Bible commentary, those, what happened 
in Ezekiel 9, setting the mark upon those who sigh and cry for the abominations. Uh, Bible commentary brings out, it will have another fulfillment. During the closing scenes of this world's history, it parallels closely with the visions of Revelation 7, 15, and 16. The distinguishing mark in Revelation is the seal of God. We know it was Tau uh, and the mar uh, a mark in Ezekiel. But here it's called in Revelation, the seal of God. And like the mark in Ezekiel is based on character, character qualifications. And the outward visible sign of this completion of the work. Now that's how they say it. I don't, you know, we could quibble about the words they chose. But it will be, the ultimate sign will be the observance of the true Sabbath of the Bible. Well, the denomination is full of people who quote-unquote observe the true Sabbath of the Bible. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, it's easy now. It's easy to uh, say, I believe in the seventh-day Sabbath. I keep it. I guard the edges. But when the time of Jacob's trouble comes, when all the affairs of this world will be in chaos and we will be blamed for the chaos and the law will be passed that you either worship and honor Sunday because that's the Sabbath according to the secular world, everything including the religious world, secular world says that. Then, and if you don't do it, you'll face the death penalty, but you won't, brothers and sisters. At that time, uh, Ellen White tells us, and I, that was probably in something I had to skip over last week or the week before, but there are two places she particularly mentions that God's people will be during this time of trouble, either hiding in the woods in the mountains or in prison cells. Now, you won't be in the cities. And you won't even be in your homes if you're out in the country. She says God's people will be hunted and they will either be in the woods and the mountains and maybe that would include places where there are no woods and mountains like the desert. I don't know how all this plays out. Or in prison cells. And so, um, and it will be about worship and the Sabbath. It, you know, our characters will have to be rid of everything else, um, dishonesty, <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> adultery, whatever it might be. That will all have to be repented of and gone, but we will have to be loyal to the seventh day Sabbath. And I, I put this long paragraph here on page 13 in from the Bible commentary because it's a nice review. I'm not going to read you uh, read it because you already we've already been through it. But it's pretty concise here. It starts with Gen Genesis about the seventh day Sabbath. It moves to Exodus 20 about the Ten Commandments, <clears throat> and then it takes in many places in Revelation about um, the apostasy and. Um, and brings in great controversy, Daniel, and another, I should have, there's another one down here that I should have put in red, another part of great controversy, several pages, that help us to get the real understanding of what we will be faced with. We don't know all the nitty-gritty, but we have the big picture, and that's good enough to get us through. We need to trust God. Now, I wanted to share with you this manuscript, 59, 1895, because it, it's part of her diary, but there are sections in the diary that are, are, are all connected, and then she goes to another section, that are, some are not relevant. Now, let me just move forward. So much to cover, isn't there? And I, I probably will. I have it there. Here we go. Our quarterly. This is the quarterly we are guided by during this quarter. 
and it's about the Sabbath, but the last three lessons are about tithing. And so this experience that I'm going to be sharing from this net manuscript, this quarterly is 1895. Did I say the manuscript? 1895 also. I just now put that together. So let's just go back to the beginning. Here we go. 1895, paragraph 43, and we'll skip around a little bit. What is the condition of those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus? If in families there are those who are refusing obedience to the Lord and keeping his Sabbath, then the seal cannot be placed upon them. And this is the part that I really like. The sealing is a pledge from God of perfect security to his chosen ones. And she gives um, a reference there of Exodus 31, 13 through 17. <clears throat> we usually, I don't know, I can't speak for everyone, but for my life, when I've been taught about the sealing, and that could have been reached back to when I was in the denomination, and they didn't teach much about it, I agree, but the idea came across that it is we who are sealed. And we are the focus of that. And we um, have to make choices. And all that is true, except I don't want the focus to be on us. What this tells me right here is that the focus is on God. God is pledging to you and to me perfect security. And that's for those who are quote-unquote sealed. Yes, we've had our battles. Yes, we've made, um, I have a little fruit fly going around here because right behind me is a box of tomatoes that I need to can tomorrow, Lord willing. And so please, if you see that floating around, it's not um, a speck on your screen. It's this annoying fruit fly. And it's the first one I've seen since I've gotten the tomatoes. But nevertheless, let's go on. This seal is a pledge from God. And our focus should be on God. What God has done for us that results in the sealing. We have cooperated. Yes, it's a team effort. But it all starts with God. And it all ends with God. And, um, and that's the message I want to get across to you. I, I, I hate to use the word I. That's the message we should understand. That yes, a seal will be placed, and yes, a mark will be placed. But the seal comes from God, and it's his pledge to us. Let me go on. Sealing indicates that you are God's chosen, not because there's anything good about us, brothers and sisters, but because we have cooperated. We've submitted to his ways. And he says, you're mine. You're my child. I accept you. I seal you, um, so to speak. You're secure in my arms of love. It's something I've done. <clears throat> Going on. As the sealed of God, we are Christ's purchased possession. And no one shall pluck us out of his hands. The seal is given in the four. Oh, and this is important also. The seal given in the forehead is God, New Jerusalem. This is Ellen White speaking. And she takes this from Revelation 3.12. I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God. And she says, that's the literal seal. <laughs> that's the seal in the forehead, so to speak. I don't know how literal it is. We have much to learn. <clears throat> but... This, Revelation 3.12, I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God. That's the seal. And But we just read, it's his pledge to us going on. This is 8T117. The seal, excuse me, the sign or seal of God is revealed. Now we are sealed. We are secure with Christ and our Father. But it's revealed. This sealing is revealed in the observance of the seventh-day Sabbath 
the Lord's memorial, as we heard in the devotional um, of creation. And that's an easy process for us in the U.S. today, usually, unless we're struggling with work issues or struggling with family pressure not to do this absurd thing of keeping the seventh day Sabbath. You know, we, we can face that. But once we cross any hurdles and we accept the seventh day Sabbath as true and righteous and we are committed to it, um, the seal of God is reser- revealed in that observance. And even now it's easy for most of us. You know, there's no force or coercion secularly speaking in the USA right now, but there will be. And when that time comes, if we still reveal, the sealed children of God will still reveal this observance of the seventh day Sabbath. And um, at the second paragraph, the mark of the beast is opposite of this, the observance of the first day of the week. This mark distinguishes those who acknowledge the supremacy of the papal authority from those who acknowledge the authority of God. And we're all familiar with that. A.T. goes on. As foretold in the 18th of Revelation, the third angel's message is to be proclaimed with great power by those who give the final warning against the beast in his image. And then she quotes Revelation 18, 1 through 6. I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lighted with his glo- lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, um, uh, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacy. So that's what the other angel coming down from heaven Uh, cried mightily, and that's what she's referring to as the third angel's message being proclaimed with great power. But she also quotes the next part of this Revelation 18 section, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues, etc. And of course, that is... um, God or Jesus speaking, speaking, come out of her, my people. This is the message given by God to be sounded forth in the loud cry of the third angel, she says. And um, going on, um, she states, it is a solemn and terrible truth. After she gives this message, And after she um, talks about this mighty angel, and then uh, quoting Revelation 18, she states, It is a solemn and terrible truth that many who have become zealous in proclaiming the third angel's message are now becoming listless and indifferent. The line of demarcation between whirlings and many professed Christians is almost indistinguishable. And I'm going to, you can read the rest of that, but I'm just going to have to come back to the manuscript, but I do want to go and close up. We're running out of time. I'll come back to this manuscript um, next week, Lord willing. Here we are. The Protestant Reformation and the Sabbath. And I'm quoting from Spiritual... The Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, starting in 179. Among the reformers of the church, an honorable place should be given to those who stood in vindication of her truth, generally ignored, even by Protestants, those who maintained the validity of the fourth commandment and the obligation of the Bible Sabbath. When the Reformation swept back the darkness that had rested down on all Christendom, 
Sabbath keepers were brought to light in many lands. No class of Christians have been treated with greater injustice by popular historians than those who have honored the Sabbath. They have been stigmatized as semi-Judaizers or denounced as superstitious and fanatical. This might happen again, brothers and sisters. The arguments which they presented from scriptures from the scriptures in support of their faith were met as such arguments are still met with the cry, the fathers, the fathers, ancient tradition, the authority of the church going on. There were some among them, however, who honored the Sabbath. This is during the time, the 1500s, there, um, the time of the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. There were some among them how uh, however, who honored the Sabbath of the Fourth Commandment. Such was the belief and practice of Karlstadt, and there were others who united with him. John Frith, who aided Tyndall in the translation of the Scriptures, and who was martyred for his faith, thus states his views respecting the Sabbath. Usually we think it's a, a matter of rejecting the papacy. That's what happened during the Protestant Reformation. But the Sabbath was involved. That's what I want, among some of them, that's what I want you to understand. Frith said, quote, the Jews have the word of God for their Saturday since it was the seventh day and they were commanded to keep the seventh day solemn. And we have not the word of God for us, but rather against us, for we keep not the seventh day as the Jews do, but the first, which is not commanded by God's law. He was martyred, by the way. A hundred years later, John Trask acknowledged, and this will be the last. We'll have to pick up later. Sorry, because we have to let the church take over. A hundred years later, John Trask acknowledged the obligation of the true Sabbath and employed voice and pen in its defense. He was soon called to account by the persecuting power of the Church of England. He declared the sufficiency of the scriptures as a guide for religious faith and maintained that civil authority should not control the conscience in matters um, of concerning salvation and I'm going to stop there because I have one.